Well, a number of people, um, a number of people have apologised for not being able to come, and you can tell them that they really missed out this week. Yeah, okay. Sorry, you folks that haven't turned up. You missed out on something. <laughs> let's, um, as as we begin, let's pray, shall we? Father, we pray that today as we think about uh, the God who rules history and the whole concept of the last days, that you will engage uh, not just our minds but our very beings uh, as, we, uh, as we seek to serve you and to know more of you in Jesus' name. Well, after this morning's reading um, and the... Uh, and the Bible talk that uh, uh, most of us have probably heard already, um, we, uh, we would be keen not just to uh, learn more, but to, but to engage uh, our, not just our minds, but our deeds and everything that we do. Um, okay, so uh, can you tell me, what do you understand by the term the last days? The last days. What do you, th what do you think it means? Days before the second coming. Thank you, Jose. Uh, do we have any other suggestions? The last days. What they, what they always say about a, a sale. It's always in its last days, so you better hurry and buy now. Hmm, the last days, yeah. So... In, um, in Christian terms, in biblical terms, when we use the term, is it, it, you say, the days before the second coming? Would anybody like to expand on that, maybe? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. If you haven't become a yeah, if you haven't be, thanks, Andrew. If you haven't become a follower, it becomes too late. So you say, it's, is it is it good news? It's good news for those who have been followers, but bad news for those who haven't. Um, you know, so good so. good good news if you're a believer. Yep. Okay. Let's. Um, okay, I'll take all those things, but I'd like us just to look at uh, Isaiah. Um, 11 and verse 9 it's, um, it's actually written out in the notes that I've given you there but for the benefit of others somebody might just like to read it to us either from the notes or from their own version it comes from um, again it's one of those readings that's popular as you come close to Christmas because it's a vision from Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 11 about uh, what things ultimately look like a sort of vision of peace if you like when um, when this one who comes from David's line is uh, is on the throne so verse just verse 9 thanks Josh Thank you. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's the, it's the whole picture of, um, let's say, divine peace. It's got children playing near um, cobras' uh, uh, nests and wolves and lambs lying down with each other and that sort of thing. And uh, this is the future. This is, this is Isaiah saying this is what's coming. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay, now we have, uh, we have reminded ourselves over the last few weeks that salvation has already happened through the death and resurrection of Jesus. But you would be aware as you read that from Isaiah that it's in fact only fulfilled in part. Does that make sense? The earth is not at this moment filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters follow the sea. Would, would that be a fair thing to say? That that is not yet complete? 
W would that be right? Salvation has happened. Christ's victory over sin and death has happened. But we have not seen the completion of that. Would that be fair? Yep, okay. So, look now at um, Philippians 2. This is a, a very familiar passage. Um, and verses 9 to 11. And it's part of that hymn to Jesus and who he is. Okay, I'm, I'm going to invite Jack to read that in a good loud voice uh, for us. Verses 9 to 11 of Philippians 2. Yes. Now, would you say, looking at the world, that every knee bows to Jesus at the name, at the name of Jesus and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God? Would you say that is a current reality? You know, you would say it's not. So, far, you might even say far from it. Okay. But would you say that that is true for some people? For some people. As, as in, is it true for, that some people think that everyone does it? Oh, no, 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 no. Would you say that, for, that some indeed would, um, that, that knees would bow at the name of Jesus and tongues confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, even if they don't literally bend the knee? Um, yeah, would you say that? Yeah. So, so this is what we call, this is the space then between Jesus' first coming and the second coming. And that's the space that we call the last days. So you're right, it's the time leading up to the second coming of Christ. But in fact, it describes this time from Christ's coming that we celebrate at Christmas and through to the second coming. So we're living in the last days. Now, when we say we're living in the last days, we are not saying that Jesus Christ will return tomorrow or next week. Though he may. But we're saying that's the space that we're in. Yeah? Okay. All right. So the coming of the last days. When Jesus was asked about... No, let me, let me go back a little while. Um, and try and put the whole course in, in context. These four sessions have been about God in history. So we talked... Two weeks ago about creation, and then last week, salvation. This week, we're talking about the last days, that section between the first and second coming of Christ that we're living in. And then, I take it, Dave is going to lead us next week on more on the future, how that, how that works and Christ's actual return which we're going to hint at today a bit as well. So, Jesus, Jesus comes along. Jesus, we, we know about his birth stories, but if we look at Mark's Gospel, no birth stories at all in Mark's Gospel. Jesus comes. And can you remember what his first words are? It's in Mark's Gospel, in chapter 1, and Jesus says... I can't actually hear that. <laughs> so for Jesus says, I'll, I'll, well, look, I'll tell you, and some of you have looked it up anyway. The time has come. The time has come. The kingdom of God is, in the older versions, at hand. The newer ones will say something like, the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near, okay? So the time has come. So this is the, this is the coming of the kingdom. 
And when Jesus asks, uh, when the Pharisees, sorry, sorry, say to Jesus, when will God's kingdom come? And you can see that in, um, in Luke chapter 17, verse 21. I won't look it up um, this time, but you, you can look it up sometime. He says, the kingdom of God is among you. Again, some of the older versions will say within you. But it, the, the idea is the same. The Greek word entos is, is in the sense of um, within, sort of within your choice, within your hands. It's, it's right there. The kingdom of God is here. It's among you. It's not, it's not then. It's not over there. The kingdom of God is here. So Jesus told parables about that as well. And uh, they start with, usually with the words, the kingdom of God is like, if it's Matthew's gospel, it will say the kingdom of heaven is like, because that's Matthew's phrase, it means the same thing. Now I'm wondering if you can think of any parables that start with the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like. Mark chapter 4 has a few of them. Indeed. The seed, so you've got, is this the seed that grows secretly underground, yeah? Yeah, you've got the four soils. Oh, the four soils, yeah. The mustard seed. The mustard seed, absolutely right. Yeah, so you, you've come up with those two. I'm, I'm very glad you called it the four soils because I think that's a much better description of it than the sower. Um, yeah. Any others you can think of? The kingdom of heaven is like. And if you were to turn to, um, uh, the reason I say Matthew 13 is that they're kind of all together there in one complete chapter. And uh, one is uh, the four soils, one's the wheat and the weeds. The kingdom, of, the kingdom of heaven is like that. The kingdom of heaven is like the, the mustard seed which grows into a big tree. The kingdom of heaven is like... Um, what, a leaven that you put into, um, into, into bread, something, yes, something like that. Um, and, and throughout these, the kingdom of heaven is like uh, a fishing net, you know, there's this fish that's good, there's fish that, that's bad. Um, and what's the message usually of those? Can, can you think of the message of the, of the soils, for instance? probably a bit unfair when you haven't got it in front of you. Um, the idea that people respond differently, yeah, to the message. Sometimes the message is on fertile ground. Uh, some of them, is, some of it's about judgment, isn't it? You know, we separate the wheat and the weeds at the final judgment and, and, the, and the dragnet or the way it can grow. So the kingdom of, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven and in, in God's kingdom, when we, when we talk about the last days, we are waiting for what to happen? I think we've already had the answer, actually. We're waiting for Christ's return. And he, he, the king in the kingdom of God, indeed. And even when Jesus is standing in front of Pontius Pilate um, at the, at the trial, just before he's crucified, um, and Pontius Pilate says, well, you are a king then, and kind of uh, acknowledges that. Uh, Jesus says, well, you say it, you've said it, but my kingdom is not of this world. So God's kingdom has come and God's kingdom is among us, within our grasp, is there. We're living in the last days, but we still pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. What's the difference between praying your kingdom come and saying the kingdom is there? And has come. How, how are we to understand that? Is that because the kingdom hasn't fully come? 
come here? And I think, I think that's right. The way I put it here, um, which I must admit is not original, I found it, I think, in the notes. We are in the last days, but we have not yet reached the last day. Do, do you see what I mean? We're there. So in that sense, it's here, but not yet, at the same time. Yeah? Does that make sense? So I... I the diagram that I got my wife to try and copy, um, and uh, she did it very well, but it's, uh, it comes up, um, I, I've come across this in all sorts of places, and you might have seen this sort of diagram as well. And at the top of the page, uh, page two there, um, oh, here we are, this is, this is the Jewish expectation of the coming kingdom. So, yeah, creation, fall and the fall brings us see what what we've gone when we talked about creation i i i talked um about non-order becoming order which is creation and disorder then which is the present evil age there and then the messiah comes and brings in the age to come and that's the kingdom of god so in other words, it's, it kind of sort, everything's sorted out, comes with judgment, and that's it. And so the, the Jewish way of thinking um, pointed to just that. And as children of Abraham, we are, well, we, we're safe. We're, we're God's people. That's, that's okay. That was the thinking. So Jesus then brings in a modification of that. It's the same at the beginning. Creation, order out of non-order, fall, disorder. And then Jesus comes and inaugurates the last days. But we're living in the kingdom of as well as this present evil age. So it's like a, a parallel where we've got, we've got both happening at the same time. And we see that. The kingdom is among us, and, and we would, I would trust that we are part of God's kingdom, that we've, we've moved you know, from death to life, from dark to light, and into God's kingdom by his grace. But at the same time, we're living in this present evil age. So we're in the world at the same time as we're in Christ. Does that... Are we both at the same time? But between the creation and the fall, the kingdom of God was on earth? Between the creation and the fall, we have an order that God has, that God has created. So this is God's... This is God's perfect kingdom as symbolized by the garden thing, okay? And the fall, that, that creates the, the disordered and evil age. And I think we talked a couple of weeks ago about this when suddenly things get blacker and blacker and blacker. And uh, by chapter 4 of Genesis, you've got somebody like Lamech, um, is it, is it chapter 4? Yes, it is. Um, who says, um, look, somebody... Um, what, what, I'm just trying to think what he says. Um, he says, a man attacked me, I've killed him, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to get revenge by seven times, by 77 times. You know, it's, it's sort of this, this blackness that's, that's really come on things as a result of the fall. Okay, so that, that's, that's the evil age. But Jesus brings in an age where salvation is available to you and to me through his death and resurrection. He inaugurates that. But at the same time, every knee is not bowing. The, the, we, can't, we cannot say that the earth is is filled with the knowledge of God in the same way that we would see that in, in God's new creation. So, that, that's, that's actually, that's tension. 
that's a time of tension because unless, um, unless you're very unusual people, you're continually drawn into, into the world, as it were, while, while being in God's kingdom. Yeah? You, you deal with that. So the question, where are we, which I've sort of answered, we're still living in the present evil age, but we can experience God's forgiveness, peace with God, and the presence of his spirit in our lives, because God's redeeming work is done. Yep. Now, I've heard a number of illustrations to this. I, I, in my simple mind, I remember my dad was very keen on board games, and um, he, uh, he liked to win, and um, even when we were small. And I, I was thinking we used to play a lot of Monopoly. Do any, any Monopoly freaks here? I haven't played Monopoly now for about 50 years, but I used to play all the time. And uh, there comes a time in a game like Monopoly when even though the game is not over, you kind of know the result um, and you keep on playing anyway. Chess might be a bit the same. Um, probably a better illustration is, is World War II, where, you know, D-Day is the beginning of the end for the, uh, for the um, Axis powers, but they are still able to create chaos over that time, even though they've lost. That's, that's the... Look, no analogy is going to be perfect, but that's the idea, okay? Well, the prophet Joel, he wrote about the outpouring of God's spirit in those days. I'm just wondering, this is something that we should turn to. Joel, one of the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, it goes. Right, um, Joel chapter 2. And verses 28 and 29. Okay. Do I have a volunteer to read verses 28 and 29 of Joel? Andrew, thank you. And afterward, I'll pour out my spirit for all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Yes. The pouring out of God's spirit that Joel talks about. Now, can you tell me where else you've read that? Pentecost, spoken by Peter, by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is this amazing time. The Holy Spirit descends on this gathering and um, without trying to be too controversial, I don't think they were in an upper room. I think they were probably in the temple. But anyway, the Holy Spirit descends on them. It's a Jewish festival, Pentecost. Okay. This is when it happens. And suddenly, these followers of Jesus are speaking words that people from all over the world can understand. And Peter explains what has happened. And it's in Acts chapter 2. Uh, Peter must have been a great uh, preacher to listen to, I reckon, when he got going. Acts chapter 2, and it's verses 17 to 21. 
he says this is exactly what Joel spoke about in the prophet Joel in the last days I will pour out my spirit there's the last days again is that what you've got in your versions in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all people your sons and daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions your old men will dream dreams in those days I will pour out my spirit even on my servants men and women alike and they will prophesy and so on and Peter goes on on the basis of what he what he understands as Joel's prophecy being absolutely fulfilled in him and the the Holy Spirit being present and empowered by that Peter goes on to call on all people if you look at verse 38 and 39 to call on everybody to repent he says each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit this promise is to you and your children and in case you wondered even to the Gentiles okay all who have called on the name of the Lord so Peter says this is this is the last days and in that sense the Pentecost experience this experience that happens with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that Jewish festival day can be regarded as the beginning of the church even actually my I, I used to celebrate Pentecost I don't know I always seem to be somewhere else on Pentecost Sunday and not here but I I used to have a birthday cake and say birthday of the church Pentecost this is when it started okay um, and this is the last days now the nature of the last days the question then uh, which is a, a, a sort of a rhetorical question is are we ready are we ready that's the big question are you ready am I ready what did Jesus say about this the coming of the last days and and our readiness and how we okay let's let's backtrack a bit the parable of the wicked tenants um, that's Matthew 21 33 to 41 Sophie could you put on your best big voice and read it to us please Thank you very much. We're not uh, keen when Jesus talks about horrible deaths at the end of his parables. Um, we might remember the nature of, of, a, of a parable was often in terms of um, exaggeration um, and, and whatever that meant. But, but, but there's always a truth in it. So what do you think about that parable what does it tell us about the final revelation reckoning. there's a reckoning 
there's a judgment, most certainly. What, what does it tell us um, about, the, um, about the people that are, the servants that are sent? He sent his servants, what are they? Sorry, prophets? prophets? Yeah, prophets. So he sends prophets. And then the son, he sends the son and they kill him as well. Yeah, is that right? Um, and at the end of that, there's a reckoning. So it's a, it's a picture of this looking forward to this time when, when Christ comes and they kill him. But at the same time, at, at the reckoning, they get, they get their reward in the sense of the share of the crop, whereas those who don't put their trust in him, they're the ones uh, who, who probably do not look forward to the final judgment. Okay? The nature of the last days. Can anybody tell me how Hebrews opens the book of Hebrews might be worth turning to that one as well Hebrews chapter 1 Luke, are you, are you there? Are you, uh, would you be happy to read verse 1 and 2 of Hebrews, please? Okay. Hebrews... Um, I, I suspect isn't really a letter. I, I, I've put down a sermon, a um, rather long one, but nonetheless it sort of develops ideas. It doesn't have the same sort of greetings that a letter has. And we don't know who wrote it either. Um, there have been lots of speculation about that. Um, but here's the message at the beginning of Hebrews. In times past, God spoke through the prophets. Same as the parable we had just now. But now in these last days, he speaks through his son. And then he goes on to say who the son is and what the son's done. Okay? The last days. Now we've said that we're in that time between Christ's coming and Christ's second coming. Can we speculate about when that second coming will be? I, I think Dave might sort of cover this a bit more next week, but can we speculate about that? Uh, a lot of sort of Christian look-alike groups, in fact, some even some mainstream people within the Christian faith do. Can we? Can we speculate? We can. We just don't have any information to base that speculation. I think that's absolutely right. Um, so you think it'll be one of those <laughs> predictors of Jesus coming? The mass counters. There's a uh, good advice from the. Uh, Alcohol, uh, people that are educated about the safety of alcohol, which is always have a plan B. Yes. Because it always seems that they do have a plan B when they, when it doesn't work out, they go, well, well, of course it didn't work out because of this other reason that I didn't bring up before, but it was always in my mind. Yeah, and Dave's absolutely right because you, you, a, a number of groups uh, really spend an inordinate amount of time speculating, coming up even, even to the extent of coming up with dates. Um, uh, 
Yes. This guy is predicting this day. Yeah, this is this is it. This is this is the return of Christ. You 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 better be ready, type of thing. And certain groups, when it doesn't happen, they say something when it doesn't happen, then they modify their way of thinking, don't they? They say, oh, well, actually, and, and in fact, in, in the case of one group, they say, well, Christ did return there, but nobody noticed. You know, that, that sort of thing. Um, but the answer is, Jesus, Jesus says in, uh, in Mark chapter 13, and uh, those verses 6 to 8, which should, which should prevent any groups, whether they're mainstream uh, Christian groups or whether they're sort of look-alike Christian groups that aren't really Christian, um, that they have no business, and we have no business to be doing that. Verse 6 to verse... Um, well, I'll start with verse 5 of Mark 13. Don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines. But this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Now, what do you know about nation fighting against nation and what do you know about earthquakes and what do you know about pandemics and, uh, and what do you know about famines? They've happened, <laughs> yeah, they've, they've happened ever since, yes, we've been around, exactly. And, and there have been times in history when, uh, when uh, people who, who self-styled prophets have got them and said, this is the end of the world, you know, at the turn of the millennium, 1000 BC, the various bubonic plagues, which if you know your history were many, many hundreds of times worse than what we've been going through <laughs> these, last, uh, these last few months, awful as it's been. So Jesus says about preaching the gospel in the last days, he says the good news about the kingdom will be proclaimed through the world. I've left three blanks there. And the, I'll tell you, end will come. The good news will be proclaimed throughout the world and the end will come. In the meantime, call to witness, call to evangelism, end of last two verses of Matthew's Gospel, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and I'm with you to the end of the earth. Acts chapter 1, you will be my witnesses. The dots there say Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, um, and to the ends of the earth. This is, this, is, this is during the last days. This is a responsibility. But there will be persecution. John 15, they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Yeah. Um, false messiahs will come saying, I am he just as we, we referred to earlier. Um, in, sorry, Mark, um, yes, Mark 13, the Antichrists of, uh, of uh, the mentioned in 1 John, which is really the, the people who will claim to be Christ or Messiah themselves. That's the nature of Antichrist, okay? Second Thessalonians, one that's... Um, Beloved of people who love talking about the second coming. Come on, Second Thessalonians, where are we? Here we are. Second Thessalonians 
chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The context is about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and so on. And, uh, and about people who say the day of the Lord has already begun. And uh, verse 3. Can I have... Jose, are you, are you volunteering there? Or? No, I'll tell you what. I'm, um, Jenny, you're a good reader, aren't you? Oh, I'm sorry, I was on Second Thessalonians. Um, am I moving too fast or too slow? I, I'm, I'm kind of fearful that in the past I've only got sort of three quarters of the way through. Dave, Dave, you'd like to read this one. Yeah. Uh, from verse three. I thought verse 3 and 4, yeah. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's sanctuary, publicizing that he himself is God. Mm. Who is the man of lawlessness? This is the one, well, um, what, do, what do we know? Um, rebelling against God brings destruction, exalts himself, defies everything that people call God, and claiming, claiming to be God himself. Is he talking about actual human or is he talking about pagan? Well, what do you think? People have come up with all sorts of theories, and, and it's probably a pointless discussion ultimately, but. Um, in the old versions, it's, uh, his son is called the man of sin. The man of sin. Now, can I just read? Uh, has anybody ever read the preface to the King James Bible? No, I, it's, not, it's not widely read, I would have to say. Um, the, I was brought up on the King James Bible, okay? Because that was the one that was around and everybody read it. And uh, even now, I find myself, when I'm quoting a scripture, I, it sometimes still goes back to the King James Bible. But in the preface, this is, I'll, I'll just read a tiny little bit of it. He goes on about how wonderful your majesty, which is King James I, by the way, of England, um, is, is who, it's, who he's referring to, how wonderful you are in sort of maintaining true religion and allowing these scriptures to be translated, etc., and writing in defense of the truth. And then he puts in brackets, which hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed. So James, you've done a wonderful work Thank you for allowing this. Thank you for the translation. Thank you for upholding the true message of the gospel. And in doing so, you've delivered a real blow to the man of sin. Who is he talking about? <laughs> no, he's actually talking about the Pope. <laughs> 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 you see, it was, it was, remember, we're talking about Reformation and Bible translation time, and it was such a big deal, really, that this was, this was, um, this was a new era when, when the, the Protestant church was formed and people were able to read the Bible for themselves, that a lot of those early reformers really got into the Pope, who they saw as the Antichrist. That was, that was very popular, and it was still popular even as recently, I think, as the 60s, when I was a child, that um, people sometimes thought maybe it was a Roman emperor. Um, having said all that, I think, it's, uh, I, I think the whole discussion is, uh, is probably a bit pointless. 
because the whole point of living in the last days is not, is not to try to get at this group of people and, and sort of say, you know, you need to become one of us. We, we have the complete trip. Here, here in Lower Mountains Anglican Parish, with the teaching that we get here, we have the whole absolute and complete truth and we are absolutely right. And you're all wrong. You see, I hope we don't think that way anymore. I trust that we think we are being as faithful as we possibly can be to the word of God and to Jesus himself. Yeah. And our aim is to be ready that was the message of Jesus in the New Testament when he talked about returning. He, he, he talked about being ready, didn't he? Being ready. So when, uh, when Martin Luther was asked this question, I think he was out gardening at the time, and somebody said, if you knew that Christ was going to return at five o'clock this afternoon, what would you do? Well, what would you do? You can answer that. If you knew that. Would you suddenly pop to your neighbour next door and let them know? Would you get on your knees so that Jesus would say you were being serious about it. Jesus would see that. Can you guess what Martin Luther's answer to that question was? Well, no, I, there isn't. Well, I, I'm not coming. I'm just. I'm just saying. It, just kind of reflect on it and, and think on it. If you knew that was going to, what would you do? You know, if you. If you're, if you're downing your, you know, third schooner of, of beer, would you sort of think, oh, perhaps I'd better leave this place and go somewhere else? What, what, I mean, what, what would you do? Um, well, what Martin Luther said was, I would be doing exactly what I am doing now. It's being ready all the time, doesn't it? Well, but, 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 but you see his point. His point was, we are ready for Christ's return. And if we are ready for Christ's return, it doesn't really matter what we're doing now. I think that's the point. If you're not ready, then you're <laughs> Yeah. And being on our knees praying is probably no more being ready than being out in the garden. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So, just a thought. Christian life in the last days. Um, okay. Five problems and five blessings for Christian life in the last days. And I'm sure you can relate to every single one of these. The first is what older versions of the Bible call the flesh. Um, it's that, that's our weakness and uh, it's been updated uh, by many to be called the sinful nature so the Apostle Paul writing in one of those chapters of Romans that we probably don't read as much as some of the others writes in chapter 7 There is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Verse 23. What a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Familiar with that one? What's the answer? Who will deliver me? Th 
thank God? The answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. In my mind I want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. This is the Apostle Paul talking. Shock. But he's human as well. So, one problem is our sinful nature. Now, Galatians 5, in case you don't recognize it, talks about uh, the fruit of the sinful nature and lists a whole heap of things that we probably would prefer not to be convicted of. Um, but Romans 8, since we're nearby anyway, verses 6 to 8. I'm actually quite thankful that after reading Romans 7, we can get to Romans 8. Um, and would somebody like to read verses 6 to 8? Josh, you, you, you're there with it, aren't you? 6 to 8. Sorry, Jenny. Well, that's problem number one, is that we are weak and human and sinful. The flesh. Number two, the world. Okay, and uh, this is to do with uh, temptation and... and World, it's, it's the use of the word world which says the, this evil world has a certain influence upon us. And that's why uh, John writes in, in 1 John, do not love the world or anything in the world. And he's not saying don't love the beautiful trees and Glenbrook Creek and uh, all the other fun things you can do. He's not, obviously not saying that. He's talking about the natural way of, of the world, if you like, to be, to be sinful and destructive. Um, okay. Um, James uh, chapter 4 talks about uh, the person, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God, which doubtless will come up in our James series at some time in the next few weeks. But I think it's probably worth looking at 1 John chapter 2. The first letter or the first epistle of John. And chapter 2. And 15 to 17. Jenny, can I dob you in this time, please? Um, on Okay, oh, you've got it? <laughs> Turning over those thin pages is sometimes quite difficult. Somebody else, okay. Jack, are you, are you up for that one? First uh, John chapter 2, 15 to 17, yep. And I think we get the picture, don't we? What um, I've, I've got a sort of new living here, and it's uh, 
Oh, do not love the world, but it says the world offers a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and, and possess. So it's saying the world offers things like, you know, the things that we can see that we want, you know, like the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, you know, that, that's the sort of idea, isn't it? The, the world offers these things which give you... Um, a very quick fix and quick, quick pleasure and okay. But um, he says, no, the, the, that's, that's a temptation. That, that will draw you away from a love of God. Yeah. Do we get that? Is, that? is that a reality? Is that a real commentary on how difficult the world can be? Be, how tempting the world can be. Oh, thanks, Andrew. I mean, think about it, um, as you say, as we were talking about, I think Anthony in the city yesterday did a bit of shopping, you know, like Christmas present. There's a dad taking me to this shop called Culture Kids. <laughs> we went in it, and, uh, and I think this is the challenge, I think the, the teenagers they face. So here's a row of, a row of t shirts and a cabinet of bling t shirt, bold red. Cocaine and caviar. Uh, That's what this is. And then there's another row of t-shirts. Dope. The red t-shirts. Dope. So here's all these young teenagers. <laughs> Let's go. What I'm saying is like, you know, that's the world we're now living in. And the trouble is... that temptation for the youngsters to... The temptation for teenagers, for instance, to be taken up by that way of thinking to be noticed, admired, accepted by your peers, all that sort of stuff. And it's cool to do those immediate pleasures of cocaine and caviar and very hot t shirts. Sure. And kids as young as 12 and 13 are dressing like that or being uh, indoctrinated. And should I ask the question then, do we grow out of it when we get to? 19 or 20, Jack will tell us that because he knows. Because uh, he's, yeah. He hasn't reached 20 yet. No. You're not 19 yet. Oh, sorry. No. Does, it, does it go on? Perhaps I should ask an older person. Does it go on? You just gentrify. Yes, exactly. You make it look a lot more acceptable. Yeah. Stuff. It's not always as obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. What sells? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So the world. Third one is the opposition that we experience as God's people. That's particularly Satan, who is called in Ephesians two, the ruler of the kingdom of the uh, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, uh, the spirit that's worked, the spirit that is at work in the hearts of the disobedient. Um, John chapter 8 talks about him being a murderer and a liar and the father of lies. And um, I, I'm particularly, I find particularly telling is, um, is 2 Corinthians 4 on this one. And this is, this is Satan's work. So chapter 4, verse 4 of 2 Corinthians. Um, so who's, who's with us on this one? Perhaps I'll read it. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So Satan's work in opposition is actually to stop people seeing. Do, do um, any of you Narnia freaks? Um, I think it was in the last battle, I'm trying to remember, where some of the, some of the dwarves could not, could not see, they thought they were in a, a rough old barn and being asked to eat um, 
decay, whereas the others could see the glorious light of Christ. Have I remembered that right? Oh, anyway, that, that's, that's the idea. Other things for those who are familiar with uh, First Peter, Satan like a roaring lion, seeking whom he'll devour. First Peter 5, that is, 8 and 9. And then also in 2 Corinthians, that uh, the devil has the ability to appear as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians, um, wait a bit, 11, 14 and 15. Yes, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. The, the, image, of, the image of Satan as an angel of light, I, I find much more convincing, actually. Um, if any of you watch the Tour de France, you, you know, the, the devil appears in the middle of the road and I... I don't find that joke figure remotely convincing in terms of Satan's work, but appearing as an angel of light, that sort of seductive get you in, I think that's very convincing. <laughs> that's, that's Satan. Okay, suffering. I would like to point out at this uh, stage that I don't like to suffer and I don't think any of us are very convinced about suffering. I, I once uh, was asked into a, into a hospital where um, an, an old archdeacon lay dying. Now Dave knows all about archdeacons. Um, they were once jokingly referred to as the crooks at the head of the bishop's staff. But anyway, um, they're often very nice people, I'm sure. But this old archdeacon was trying to convince me that he was enjoying his suffering as a servant of Christ. And I must admit, I didn't find that very convincing myself, but that's, that was his way of looking at it. But Paul talks about the privilege of suffering for him. And uh, Romans 8 again, the idea of creation groaning like... Do you remember groaning like a woman in childbirth? Now, I've only witnessed childbirth directly on four occasions, and I was not suffering the pains of childbirth myself. I was just watching somebody else. Um, it seemed to me a good illustration, a good way of describing this, this creation and the suffering, yet the new birth is, is worth it, that sort of thing. First Peter chapter 2, um, that uh, Peter says, continue to do good, even if it means suffering. So suffering is sent as a test of faith, Will it strengthen our faith? Or will it destroy it? I'll leave that one. And death. It's interesting that uh, when we look at 1 Corinthians, that whole chapter of 15, which is the great... Um, it's the great resurrection chapter about Jesus' resurrection and our resurrection. Ultimately, Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits yeah, of the resurrection of believers. And death, the Apostle Paul calls in the middle of that chapter, he calls it the last enemy to, uh, to be destroyed is death. So death is enemy. Um, 1526, um, he says, uh, first of all, 
there's the harvest of all who belong to Christ, then the end will come, turns the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power, Christ must reign until he humbles all enemies beneath his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And um, Robin, do you have 1 Corinthians 15 in front of you? And verse, uh, perhaps verse 56, we, right at the end. Verse 56. Yes. And uh, you can read the next verse as well because this this is Yes. Good good reading probably for a for a Christian funeral the end of 1 Corinthians 15 um, where Paul says death is swallowed up in you know death where's your victory death where's your sting sin is the sting that results in death the sting of death is sin okay but thanks be to God he gives us the victory so when I um, I don't know if this has happened to Dave but when I've, I've I've conducted a funeral of somebody who was not part of the church and by no by no discernment that I I have could I identify them as a believer but they want something they want a Christian minister and they want it in a place that looks like a church and um, and then it's happened to me three or four times they give me a little poem that says don't think of me as dead I, I'm just in the next room and I said but but that's rubbish you're not just in the next room um, you know, death is final, it's finished, except through Christ, who gives us the victory. And um, Romans 6.23, some of you will know this one off by heart, the wages of sin is death. As a... Um, as a teenager, as a rather disobedient teenager, I used to go and watch my beloved uh, soccer team playing on a Saturday afternoon and my parents didn't allow me to go but I used to say I'd gone somewhere else but used to go and watch. I don't think any of you ever did anything like that as teenagers but you were probably good, good boys and girls. And uh, around there were these guys and they they had these placards that they used to walk around with and <laughs> one of them said prepare to meet thy God and the other said the wages of sin is death and they walked around the outside of the football ground the soccer ground and made me feel extremely guilty so I sort of hid around the corner amongst the 20 or 30,000 other people that were there and hoped I hadn't been recognised. What they omitted to put on their placard, of course, was it doesn't just stop with the wages of sin, it goes on to talk about the gift of God that's eternal life. Sorry, experience from my childhood. My teenage years. I think I was about 14 or 15. But there are blessings. This is the other side. We have resources. And there are five of those as well. And one is the gospel. This is, this is our hope. What's, what Paul writes to the Colossian church, your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. In first, at the beginning of Colossians, he says, look, I've heard about what a wonderful church you are. I've heard of, of all the things that you're doing. You're wonderful people. I have heard about your faith, your love, and your hope. Your faith in what God has done for you in the past through Jesus. Your love in the present for what you, how you are now and your hope for the future. It's the past, present and future, I think, of the Christian life. 
That's what he writes to the Colossians, your hope. Does anybody know the, 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 the Christian symbol that was adopted in the, in the early church for hope? You know, like faith was a shield and love was a heart. What, do you know what hope was? Oh, okay. It was an anchor. Anchor. You will sometimes see it in older churches in stained glass windows. The anchor is, is the, it's the idea it's secure, you see. The, that's, that's your hope. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly uh, try and whip through the others. Uh, Romans 5 talks about endurance, developing character and character, strengthening your confident hope of salvation. That's something we have. It's the message of the gospel that gives hope. And 1 Peter 3.15 is the the classic verse as to why we should witness for Jesus. Um, Always be prepared to give an account of the hope that is within you. Okay, hope. We have help. That's the Holy Spirit. Our uh, operators disappeared. Yep. Um, Called um, in John chapter 14 another advocate, and in those three places the guarantee. A guarantee. A guarantee of what? Do you remember? Inheritance? Yes. Absolutely. Guarantee of inheritance. Um, okay and uh, Galatians 5 I'll just move on to that one Um, that's that's the fruit of the spirit the idea being that if if the Holy Spirit is among us within us that we will hope to see fruit yep Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc., etc. Galatians 5, the Holy Spirit among us. Third one is the Bible. Oh, thanks, Josh. Um, Which will make you wise for salvation. Um, Romans talks about uh, the Scriptures giving hope and encouragement as we wait for the fulfilment of God's promise. And Hebrews 4.12, this is, this is the classic one that lots of people know. Um, the word of God is, what, what is it? Anybody remember? Sharper than a two-edged sword. Um... Let me just read that one. Uh, is this 4 verse 12? The word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Whoa. The word of God speaks to us. So if you were challenged in any way, or if I was challenged anyway, by the word of God as it was proclaimed this morning, you probably shouldn't be too surprised. So we have the Bible as a great as a great blessing. We don't worship the Bible, but it points us to Christ. Prayer. I... uh, One of the strangest experiences of my life was getting, realising, or was getting close to retirement. Now, for some of you, it's not even something you need to think about. And neither did I until 2017. 
And uh, I thought, what shall I say to these people as a sort of, as I leave, what shall I, how shall I do it? You know, how, how can I give them encouragement? This is, this is 25, 30 years of, um, of ordained ministry. What, what, do I, what do I do with it? Uh, how, what do I talk about? How, how, can I, how can I do this? So I thought, well, the next to the last Sunday before I, I have to retire because I reached the magic, uh, a magic age, you see. So the next to the last Sunday, I thought, in general, it'll be a regular congregation. Last Sunday, I'll have lots of visitors, so I've got to try and see what I can do. So what I did was the next to the last Sunday, I took that reading there from Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2 and 3. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. I guess that wasn't my experience in that sense, but pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. So it's kind of a call to prayer. The last Sunday I changed tack completely and took the early chapter of Colossians talking, I talked about faith, hope and love and the, the gospel. So I don't know, that seemed to be the right thing to do or I trust the Holy Spirit was inspiring, but that's what I did. Ephesians 6 verse 18, uh, that passage all about putting on the armour of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times. Be alert and persistent. And Revelation 5 verse 8, which is probably a slightly unusual one. It's the whole crowd of people before the throne of God when it looks as if we're never going to find the plan of salvation and what's going to happen until somebody says the lion of the tribe of Judah is the one who can open the scroll. And the, the, what I'm having, I don't really want to go into that too much, but it said that of those who were in the, in the throne room of God, beings and elders and so on, they held golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. I'm certainly not suggesting the introduction of incense, so please don't understand that. But, I, but if you see the imagery, it's to say that in the presence of God, in the throne room of God, is this, is, are the prayers of God's people. So don't ever think that your prayers are a waste of time. And don't ever think that they're not heard. Yeah? That's, that's what I got from that. Um, and it is a follow-up, of course, to the victory that's been won from verse 5 of that. And uh, last fellowship, the fifth one, um, the, the classic verse is the Hebrews one, loved of, um, loved of senior ministers uh, in particular, uh, where you, you're kind of trying to tell people off without telling them off, if you think you can manage that. Hebrews 10 verse 25, do not forsake to meet together as some are doing. You know, so it's kind of, why aren't you coming to church? It's very important. You know, you need that fellowship. You need to come together. You need to come and meet together. And, um, and uh, look what the scriptures say. But you can't say it too strongly because if you do that, people think you're telling them off. So don't forsake to meet together. Keep on meeting together, fellowship. The, body of, the whole body of Christ image, well, really, the whole of the New Testament, all those, all those, nearly all those letters 
of Paul are to, are to churches, uh, some to individuals, but there's still individuals within churches. So, you know, letters are to the church at Ephesus or the church at Philippi or the church at Colossae or the church at Rome or whatever else, Corinth and all the rest of them. These are letters to churches and, and uh, Paul writes, you know, we're, we're the body of Christ and the body of Christ has as its head Who? Who's the head? Christ. With Christ as the head, Christ is the head of the church. And it would seem to me that if you have a so-called church without Christ as the head, all you've got is a religious club. And I actually couldn't be bothered with that. <laughs> yep. Christ as the head. <coughs> Colossians, again, I go back to my beloved Colossians. The description in chapter 1 of who Christ is, you know, the visible image of the invisible God and so on. And in verse 18, he changes tack. Would somebody like to read 18 to 20? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, he is also the head of the body, the church. Yep. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross. Yes. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. Yes. And you could go on and read the rest of Colossians chapter 1 because it's inspiring. And um, that's fellowship. That's the importance of meeting together and the importance of being together in Christ's name with, with Christ as the head. That's, yeah. Interesting to the Hebrews passage where it's yep. placed. It's immediately after he's gotten rid of almost every reason why a Jewish person would need to come together. You know, there's no more sacrifices done. Yep. Really yep. Yep. Um, so there's no need to gather to do that. No yep. to, and then straight away, so therefore, let's stop meeting together. Um, actually, you need to encourage each other in this, in this news, this gospel. That in fact, yeah, that in fact, the, one, of the, one of the big pluses of meeting together is meeting together. Uh, the, the reason to meet together is to meet together. That's what, that, that's what it is. Yep. The trouble is that we've always, we often try to go back further into Hebrews and make something of that gathering that it's not meant to be as well. Um, you know, and so you know, the extreme end of the heresies of some that would be, you know, we've, we've come together in order to re sacrifice Christ. How, how do you get on, Dave, with those people? And I, I would have had hundreds of them over the years that tell me you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I'd say, <laughs> I'd say, yeah, I don't know. I'd say, that's, uh, that's interesting. I've never met one. <laughs> yes. I've never met a Christian that does go to church, that doesn't seek to go to church. Mm. You know? um, so it's what's, what sort of a believer are you? If, if you're not wanting the fellowship of other believers, what, how, does, how does that work? But no, I still, I still get it. You don't, have to be, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Okay. Let's finish. I, I, it's just my, my concluding thoughts. Um, we're living in the last days. Uh, Christ's death and resurrection inaugurated the coming of God's kingdom. Because we're living in two opposing kingdoms, there are serious problems, but also significant blessings. Christ's victory is already achieved, but yes, we are still to experience 
that final consummation or the, the last day. Yeah. How about we pray? Father, we thank you for that victory that uh, we know in Jesus Christ. And we thank you that uh, although we, we may live in a world which wants to draw us away from you, and uh, we still have that uh, sinful nature that uh, ourselves pulls us away from you, yet at the same time, you've given us... Um, You've given us hope for the future. You've given us the scriptures that we can learn from. You've given us each other in our fellowship. Uh, and you've given us prayer by which we can communicate as well. And you've given us the, the, the help of the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, we may do so in that uh, confident hope that uh, we are yours in Jesus' name. Um, could I just say one thing? I've, I've finished, but I just wanted to say one quick thing. Uh, I'm, I'm apologising in advance just in case. I may not be here next week. I have um, a, a procedure on Thursday that may mean I can't come. And if, if you feel inspired to pray about that, it would be great. I do hope I'll be here. That's in the speculative hope, not the sure and certain hope that we talk about in the scriptures. <laughs>